Shinseirio, who will speak about uh, uh, topological phases of matter and quantum entanglement. This will be the first uh, of the series of uh, two hour lectures that we have in this uh, uh, program uh, for the benefit of everybody that uh, want to have an overview of the subjects of the topics of this uh, uh, program. So we will have uh, this kind of lectures once or twice a week. Uh, in general on Tuesday and if necessary on Thursday uh, at, and uh, so that's the first one uh, okay so please uh, you, you can start thank you uh, thank you Andrea and uh, yeah thank you for having this uh, nice workshop and thank you for having me and I'm particular thankful for uh, local organizers um, so um, today I'd like to um, go over some basic uh, uh, some basics of topological phases of matter with some emphasis on quantum entanglement. Um, so um, I, I will start with this um, uh, basic uh, classification of phases of matter. I mean, it's not a full classification, but just to, for the purpose of guiding you. So um, I, I will be mostly interested in phases which, which are not characterized by local order parameter. Um, so that's something we may call quantum disordered phases. Um, and then um, another important uh, ingredient is the, the the excitation gap. So we will be interested in gapped phases of matter. So we are here. And then um, I think these gapped phases of a matter, um, there may be interesting topological properties. Um, so some of them I'm, I'm listed here. Um, so I will be mostly interested in topologically order the phases of matter in two plus one dimensions. Um, sometimes these phases are called long range entangled state. Um, so um, I, I will be basically focusing here today. There are other talks, I think uh, uh, other lectures as well. Um, their uh, emphasis can be more on um, um, these uh, uh, short range entangled state. Um, sometimes they are also called invertible states and with symmetries, uh, they can be uh, symmetry protected topological phases. Um, but I will mostly staying here today. Um, the topologically ordered states, it can be also discussed with or with, without symmetries. But once again, I'll be staying here, this plain vanilla topologically or the other phases of matter. Okay. Oh, so by the way, um, yeah, if you have any question, please, please just interrupt me. Um, the, uh, I, I think I, I will stay with very basic uh, materials and they, um, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Um, so what, what are these uh, um, topologically or the other phases? Here's some uh, basic properties. So these are basically um, phases which support um, anionic excitations, and they um, they are closely related to something called topological ground state degeneracy. So it's a, a ground state degeneracy which depends on the topology of space. And the, as I as I already emphasized, these are the phases which are not described by uh, uh, symmetry breaking, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, another way to say this is that there's no um, kind of conventional Randall Ginsburg type theories to describe such phases. Um, instead, topologically ordered phases, they are characterized by um, topological quantum field theories. Um, they, there's some basic data uh, characterizing such uh, theories, such as fusion and braidings. And I, I will go over some of these data in, in a minute. And here is some um, comparison between spontaneous asymmetry broken phases and topologically ordered phases. And if, for example, ground state uh, for uh, SSB phases, their degeneracy basically uh, 
uh, uh, uh, just by symmetry breaking, which is not topology dependent, whereas we could have a topological degeneracy for topologically ordered phases. And the um, same, we are also going to talk about excitations um, um, above the ground state. And, they, and as I already said, there, there's the anions. And basically, the properties of anions are important data characterizing topologically ordered phases. <clears throat> important examples of topologically ordered phases include, of course, the fractional quantum whole states. Um, so these, these are perhaps most experimentally um, established examples of, of topologically ordered phases. But there are also other examples, such as the um, topological phases realized in, in quantum spin systems. So yeah, we could have quantum spin liquid, for example. Um, right, so let me now go over the data characterizing uh, uh, these uh, topologically ordered phases. So there's a mathematical framework known as a uh, unitary modular tensor category. Um, so this is the um, this is a synonym of topological quantum field theory in this context. Also, we may not have um, Lagrangian description, or we, we don't need Lagrangian descriptions. Um, we, we could have Lagrangian descriptions such as the um, Chan Simon series, but but at some point we don't really need to talk about uh, Lagrangian descriptions. So um, that's the just a set of data. Uh, that characterizes the um, properties of anionic excitations in uh, two plus one dimensions. Um, <clears throat> so in this description, we have a um, set of anions which, which may obey very peculiar exchange statistics. But anyway, we first specify a, a set of finite anions. And usually this one means a trivial particle, like a vacuum. But, but, uh, but in addition, we could have more non-trivial particles. Here we just symbolically call them A, B, and, and so on. Um, so these anions, they can uh, fuse to create other excitations. So fusion is a one first important ingredient. And uh, this is a set of diagrams, which I uh, don't go through details, uh, but I will perhaps use some examples later, but um, um, in, in, in describing this uh, uh, tensor category theory or topological quantum field theory, uh, it is very convenient to use these diagrams. So I'm drawing diagrams and then, um, but they're like, um, there's a specific uh, quantum mechanical meaning for each uh, diagram. Um, but, but anyway, um, the data of, of these topological theories, they can be described by the set of diagrams with some uh, uh, associated uh, 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 numbers and coefficients. Okay, so, so what first, first set of data is a fusion. So um, anions, if you combine anions, they can form a, a different anion. Or if you have one anion, you can also split a, a anion into uh, different anions. So that the fusion rule obeyed by these anions, anionic excitations, and then uh, this is described by this diagram or this diagram, and the, this coefficient n, uh, ncab, describe this, this fusion. Um, so if a, 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 a and b anions can fuse into this fusion, uh, different anion c, you, you have non-zero this fusion coefficient, okay? Um, so here are some examples for, for the a, a, a fusion rules. So toric code is a um, particular kind of topological order. It has a, um, uh, 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 four kinds of particles, trivial particle, uh, electric particle, and a magnetic particle. And the F uh, is a combination of electric and magnetic particles. And then they obey uh, these fusion rules. So if I, for example, fuse uh, E and M particles, I get new particle, which I call F. And there are other fusion rules. Um, there's another, another example where here it's, it's Ising anion theory, where I have a three kinds of particles, uh, one and the sigma and psi. And for example, if I fuse um, uh, sigma, uh, uh, two sigma particles, 
I, I get either trivial particle or uh, fermion psi. Um, so this is the um, Ising fusion rule, okay. Um, compared to toric code and Ising uh, theories, one difference is that this particular fusion rule where fusing these two sigma particles, we get two possible outcomes. So this is a case where we have a non abelian uh, uh, fusion, whereas for the case of toric code, uh, all outcome is unique. So, so this is the uh, example of abelian topological order. Okay, anyway, so this is the example of fusions. Um, now, um, there's another data, which we call F, usually called F symbol. Um, so that basically specifies the way we combine uh, different anions to form a, a bigger Hilbert space. So this is quite similar to, to uh, 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 angular momentum addition of uh, uh, spin uh, in quantum mechanics. So we, we can combine um, uh, spins in, 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 in different ways. Um, for example, if we combine three uh, uh, spin, uh, SU2 spins, uh, there are uh, various ways to do it, but uh, uh, in the end, we should get uh, uh, the same Hilbert space of three spins. And this F symbol specifies uh, how we combine these different anions to get a composite system. And then um, there's the um, uh, requirements that different way of combining or fusing uh, anions get the same uh, Hilbert space. The final set of data is this uh, symbol R, and that describes the um, braiding. Um, so, so now, this, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, diagram, there is this uh, twisting, which, which corresponds to the um, exchange. This is a part of the exchange in the space time, time, the space time diagram where anions propagate and eventually they switch the positions. Okay, so, um, so this is also another important piece of data. Okay, um, so um, these are uh, kind of skeleton or bare bone of the, uh, this theory. But they are not they are not very measurable quantities. Um, so they are more accessible quantities, which I also want to discuss. So these are uh, these set of data. Question? Yeah. Hi, this is Christopher. Christopher Midri. Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question. If you take your the previous transparency, if you just start uh, your rules by giving this uh, set of diagrams. Why is it that you allow only a vert uh, for the first one where you do fusion rules? Why is it that you only allow uh, two alt, uh, one particle goes into two? I mean, a vertex with three legs. Why not a vertex with uh, five legs or seven legs? That's right. So we could have a uh, like a vertex with four legs, for example, one, two, three, four. And then we usually resolve it into uh, two trivariant vertices. So essentially, you're saying anything more complicated uh, when you describe the fusion rules can always be br brought. Back yeah, we, we want to decompose it into into these trivariant uh, fusions. Right, that's the game of the room. I'm not sure if we can be more creative here. Yeah, three is fundamental in that sense. Okay, other questions? Okay. Um, so um, the, the, these are basic data, but there's some inconvenience or um, unphysicalness for this data such that this data depends on the, the basis we choose. We call it their gauge dependent and the gauge dependent quantities are not easy to measure. Um, on the other hand, the data listed here, they are constructed from the previous data, NFR, but these data are gauge independent, basis independent, and uh, that somehow indicate that these are more physical or at least easier to measure. Okay, so the, these, quanti the, these quantities are quantum dimensions of particles and the T and S matrices and the, and the uh, uh, chiral center charge, at least the mod eight part of the chiral center charge. 
So quantum dimension, um, it's, it's diagrammatically written here. So this can be computed from the previous, uh, using the, the diagrams from the previous slide and the data associated to each diagram. And this describes somehow the um, uh, Hilbert space dimension associated to, to each particle, roughly speaking. And then if I uh, sum over uh, the, this, each quantum dimension squared and take a square root, that defines a total quantum dimension. Okay, so that this is this quantity will appear quite often uh, uh, in the in the foreign uh, 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 exposition. And so there's a modular T matrix uh, which is described by this diagram, and this there's this uh, crossing which is included here. So um, this describes the um, um, self statistics like a spin. Of, of the particular anion, as you can perhaps see from the crossing here. So you twist the space time, that space time diagram of a, a anion world line. So that's where uh, uh, self statistics, information on the self statistics is included in here. This is also called topological spin, or this theta or H, they are called topological spin. And then um, there's another data, which is uh, called modular S matrix. And it, once again, it is represented by diagram here. And this uh, now encodes the um, braiding of two, two anions. So there are now two um, uh, world lines involved, A and B, and they are linked like this. So this quantity is called modular S matrix. Um, the, the final quantity is chiral center charge uh, mod eight, and then it's defined by this quantity. And then I'm also going to mention um, this quantity later. Okay, so these are once again, convenient quantity in the sense that they are uh, gauge invariant. Okay, so let's, there are a lot of um, formal definitions. So let me now slowly move toward more physical understanding of this data. So first, let me discuss S and T matrices, and they are related to the properties of a degenerate ground state. So as I said, uh, topological states support ground state degeneracy. That's the degeneracy depending on the topology of the space. And here, for simplicity, I consider a um, torus, spatial torus. So I take uh, this uh, square, and the up and the bottom, uh, left and right, they are identified, OK? Um, so I have a, a different uh, ground state supported by this spatial torus. Um, and then S and T uh, uh, modular transformation, um, um, they can be thought of as the um, geometrical or uh, topological operation on this uh, spatial torus. Um, so T and S, uh, they act on a, a torus and it creates the uh, new torus. But that's actually the, the torus, which is equivalent to the original one. Um, under this uh, uh, topological or geometrical operation, uh, ground state is going to be changed. OK, so maybe, maybe I should have drawn the um, picture for T more clearly. But what this T does is, is that if you have a spatial torus, you kind of first cut the torus somewhere and the twist by 180 degree and then reconnect, okay? So if you do that, uh, um, you are torus, as a, as a spatial torus, you get the um, same uh, uh, torus, but your ground state is going to be changed. So if you start from a particular ground state, by this operation, you create a new state, which is a linear superposition of, of the, of the uh, states degenerate on the torus. So uh, there's this, uh, you get some linear superposition and this coefficient is given by the entries of this T matrix, which is uh, uh, introduced here. And similarly, there's S module transformation, which is more like a, a rotation or a 90 degree rotation of the space-time torus. And once, once again, you get the, um, um, linear super, once you do this operation, you get a linear superposition of a different ground state. And the, uh, this uh, coefficient uh, is described by the entries of S matrix. Okay. Um, so um, 
this um, S and P matrices, they can be used as a um, characterization of a different topological order. For example, if you observe uh, topological degeneracy in, let's say, in, in your numerics, which suggests that you may be having a topological order. But once again, we want to, to know which topological, which particular topological order is happening in, in, your, in your computer. In this case, we may want to measure these S and T matrices, which may narrow down a, a topological order. Um, unfortunately, S and T, although they are convenient topological data, they are not completely specifying a underlying topological order, although quite often S and T may be almost enough to know everything about the underlying topological order. That is the case when the number of allowed anion excitations is small. Um, but if you have a more complicated topological order, uh, uh, S and T may not completely specify underlying topological order as described by these uh, uh, recent papers. Okay. Um, so let me let me move on. Is there a question for S and T matrices? I want to move on to um, another piece of data, which is chiral central charge. So um, I talked about chiral central charge mod eight, which is a part of a um, topological data, uh, which we just discussed. So C can be computed from the underlying data N, F, R. Um, we can also discuss a chiral central charge without mod eight. Um, so that is going to be the um, chiral central charge associated to the excitation of the edge mode of topological order, uh, phases that can appear if you have if you have a, um, a physical uh, boundary to the system. Um, so this is particularly important because this central charge, chiral central charge, can be measured by a um, transport measurement. So it's related to thermal conductance at the edge. And this has been measured experimentally in, in, in these systems. And then um, this provides a very important uh, 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 information on the topological order the state realized in the experiment. Okay. Um, there's a dist distinction between a chiral central charge mode eight and the chiral central charge itself because chiral central charge mod eight is a part of topological data. So it is tied to N and FRR. Uh, without mod eight uh, distinction, uh, chiral central charge should be considered as an independent uh, data from NFR, although they may be related. In particular, uh, uh, different topological order, sorry, sorry, the same topological order in the sense of NFR, um, they could still have a different chiral central charge. But, but anyway, chiral central charge uh, is an important part of topological data we want to know. Um, and then, yeah, so I just gave a, a quick overview of uh, some basic data characterizing a topological ordered state. And there are other data. Um, in particular, with symmetry, there are a lot of other data. For example, if we have a um, conservation of U1 charge, then the um, important uh, topological data is a, is a whole conductance sigma xy, as, as, as we know in the physics of fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, symmetry doesn't have to be a, a U1. It can be more complicated symmetries. Um, let's say some, some uh, unitary on-site symmetry G or maybe crystalline symmetry and so on and so forth. And, and in this case, there's a um, somewhat more uh, extended version of the category theory we just discussed. And um, then um, um, such characterization is discussed in these papers. So that's described the, um, fusion and the braiding in the presence of symmetry defects. So symmetry defect, we should be able to treat as a kind of um, addition to anions. And then we have some uh, similar rules we just discussed. Um, but I, 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 won't, I won't go in much to this uh, SET symmetry enriched topological order phases, okay? And then there can be 
other kind of data, such as the geometrical data. So the um, data we have just discussed, they're all topological uh, uh, in the sense that they are related to um, space-time topology of, for example, any on diagrams, or they are related to uh, topological grounds, the degeneracy. But uh, physics uh, is somewhat, somewhat richer, so we could have more data characterizing uh, uh, topologically ordered phases. So in the quantum Hall effect, uh, there's a um, quantity known as Wenzi term, shift, Hall viscosity, and the, uh, a lot more. Um, these are geometrical data in, in the sense that it couples to the underlying uh, metric of, of the uh, uh, system. Um, but these are important uh, characterization of, of uh, topological order phases. So uh, I think uh, at this stage, there are two kinds of questions we can ask, or perhaps more, but at least there are two kinds of questions. So one could always ask, uh, do we know um, all data characterizing different topological phases of matter, or are there um, topological phases or topological data, which we, we, we don't know yet, or maybe something like a fractons, we perhaps don't know a full characterization, uh, data characterizing the uh, a, a, a fractons theory. Maybe there's some recent development in that direction. Um, so that's the um, first question. Um, other question is that given these data, how do we, how do we extract, how do we measure such data in the experiment or maybe even in numerical experiment. And I, I mentioned some of these quantities are, are measured experimentally. I already mentioned color centered charge can be measured in experiment. And that's an important piece of uh, uh, information to narrow down underlying topological order. Um, recently, there's the indirect observation of braiding statistics in, in this experiment, which is uh, I just pro, uh, show, show you the, some experimental data. So um, braiding statistics has been discussed for a very long time, but direct measurement is still difficult. There's a recent um, um, progress in this direction. Although this is still for Iberian braiding statistics, it's a, it's a great uh, advance in this field. And then one could ask what kind of, um, what, what combination of these uh, uh, data, F, R, N, um, what kind of combination can be experimentally measured? Or what kind of combinations are experimentally relevant? We can ask that kind of question. Um, and the related question, which is perhaps very similar to the second question, but the question I want to focus today is that, uh, let's say we are given a uh, ground state. Okay, maybe we get from a um, um, experiment or we get from some numerical uh, uh, simulations. From the ground state alone, can we extract a, um, some of, maybe not all, but at least some of topological data? Can we extract, extract from the ground state? That's, that's the um, question I'm going to focus today. Um, for example, we may want to know um, um, modular data, S and T and center of charge. Um, there are many works uh, uh, proposing a protocol to uh, extract S and T matrices. Um, today, I want to focus on entanglement related quantities such as entanglement entropy, entanglement negativity, and the other quantities. And then um, as, as we are going to discuss, uh, these uh, entanglement related properties or, or entanglement related quantities, they are going to capture at least some part of the topological data. Okay, so that's my um, uh, plan. So I will first discuss entanglement entropy, and then I will move on to entanglement negativity. And if time allows, I also discuss other, other operations. Okay, um, is, is there a question so far? Am I too fast or am I too slow? <laughs> okay, so just let me know if you have uh, questions. So let me first discuss uh, topological entanglement entropy. So once again, we consider uh, topologically ordered phases, um, let's say in two spatial dimensions. And then 
I by partition my total system um, into two parts, A and B, and I, I consider once again ground state. Okay, I, I have a ground state, and then from the ground state, and the, with this by partitioning, we get the uh, uh, density matrix or reduced density matrix associated to this region A. And um, so then the uh, we compute the uh, entanglement entropy S S A, which is defined by this. And then what what these people uh, these papers showed is that this entanglement entropy has a, um, a topological universal part, which which encodes the um, important information of topological order uh, state. So S A has a uh, area row part. So this part is proportional to the size of the system A. This is a conference of the system A. Um, but then there's this, uh, this, this piece minus log D, where D is the total quantum dimension. Um, so um, this scaling uh, is, a, um, is an important tool to identify underlying topological order, which can be used, for example, in numerical experiments. So here, this is example for J1, J2 uh, 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 spin model, and then um, if you look at the scaling of entanglement entropy as a function of this uh, size of system A, uh, this uh, uh, by interpolation, uh, we may be able to infer the total quantum dimension of, of um, underlying topological order. So that's a um, um, important one of the important characterization of topologically ordered, ordered state. Okay. Um, I want to quickly go through how we conclude this uh, uh, scaring, scaring law. Uh, so one way to do this is to start from topological. So one way to, to do this is take a particular uh, 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 model, such as Rebin Wen model or maybe Tori Code model. And in these systems, we can compute uh, SA uh, exactly. And then we will we will see this uh, type of uh, scaring. Um, I will go with somewhat more field theoretical ways. I follow this paper by Don and companies. Uh, so this is the uh, this uses the um, topological quantum field theory technique, um, and then we we basically recover this uh, topological entanglement entropy here. Um, so. Um, so we, we, we uh, 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 proceed as follows. So we first prepare a, a ground state of the system by pass integral. So we start from a, uh, we, we consider pass integral from nothing to, to S2. And then with this pass integral, uh, we prepare a, a, a state on S2. S2 is a spatial manifold. But in terms of space time, I, I get the um, pass integral manifold, which is a three, which is a topology of three ball. Um, so I prepare my, my state by this pass integral. And then density matrix corresponds to taking a bra and ket. So I have a two such a, a three balls. And then, um, then we, 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 we follow, uh, we use the replica trick to first compute the uh, moments of of uh, uh, the reduced density matrix, trace row A, uh, trace row A squared, trace row A to power N. Okay, so here I just uh, list two, two such cases. So, so then taking a, a, a now trace, we identify the part of the uh, 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 three balls, that's, that's the part which we pass integrate. And then um, we finally take a trace, so that's also another pass integral where I identify this part and this part. Um, so then this type of calculation can be done for arbitrary powers of the radius density matrix. Here are the example where I have a um, uh, second moment and so on and so forth. So, so in the end, what happens in this calculation is that you can derate the, um, this uh, kind of quantum mechanical expression trace of rho a to power n. You can derate it to the pass integral of or on single uh, three-dimensional sphere S3. 
Um, there's some normalization which we have to take care of. That, that gives you additional factor of one over this partition function raised to power n. Okay. So, it's, so in the end, this uh, quantity captures the um, um, data associated to the partition, uh, pass integral on S3. And then that is related to the mod zero, zero entry of modular S matrix. And that is actually equal to one over total quantum dimensions. So this way uh, we can recover uh, uh, the, uh, 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 this part of, of the topological ent uh, entanglement entropy scaling, topological entanglement entropy. Okay, so this is a, a beautiful calculation. It kind of makes it clear, the, the topological content of this entanglement entropy clear. Um, since it's a fully topological calculation, it does not give us this um, fast part, the, um, uh, the, the part which depends on the, the, the divergence for lengths. So that's the, this purely topological entropy calculation does not know about this part. Okay, um, so this is all good. Yeah, you can say that that term has been regularized to zero in this topological field theory. Yeah, so that's that's right. I don't actually fully understand how it gets regularized, but that that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So it can perhaps add some counter term or something like that. Since I have a question. Yeah. Um, how does all of your analysis depend on the choice of A and B? Right, so here, um, distinction may appear, uh, uh, for example, um, if A and B are, um, okay, so, so there's a mild dependence. So uh, of course, since it's topological, um, the, the, the precise shape of this A and B doesn't matter much, um, but there's some topological dependence on, on A and B. So for example, if, I have a total space, which is a torus. And if A wraps around the torus, then we will see some, um, some change. We, we are going to sh see this in the later section. Well, I was more thinking, uh, you, you make an uh, implicit assumption that you're choosing a, ba a basis. So I don't know, is A and B always in real space? Or if I went to momentum space and I cut uh, ah. my system, in, if I choose a basis in momentum space, what happens? Yeah, yeah, so that's the um, that's an important question. So here I'm always making a special uh, uh, partition that's somehow universal. That we that's something I can always do. Um, other type of partition may be possible. For example, people study uh, particle partition in in quantum hole systems, where we partition, you know, um, make a partition depending on the particle record right? from one to n. These particles are in, in sub Hilbert space A uh, from particle number, I don't know, 10 to 100 there in, in, in the subsystem B. So that's something you can also do, but you know, um, I think to make such a, uh, um, the momentum space partition as well, uh, but I think to make such partition, we need additional um, conservation law. For example, to make a particle partition, we have, we should be able to count particles. So. Uh, particle number should be should better be conserved. I think usually we don't consider momentum partition in many body system. Uh, maybe we can, but but uh, that's the um, that's the um, um, uh, we need some symmetry to to do to this type of a partition. So what what is the symmetry? Part, uh, what is the symmetry that uh, that dictates that you do it in real space then? Yeah. Good. I, I guess. Uh, um, I think it's a special. We are making use of spatial locality, so there's no conservation law. But somehow we think it's it's there's some local uh, space. Space uh, carries some sort of locality, so that's why we can make a partitioning. We can also consider something like all to all interactions, like S phi K model. So then you can make whatever partition we make. Um, yeah, that that's that's the. So yeah, that part is not related to conservation law, but more like a locality. Yeah, so we can be create, uh, quite creative uh, in that respect. And then that leads to a different way of partitioning system 
or we can inter, 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 incorporate a symmetry into the partitioning that leads to symmetry resolve the entanglement and, and, the, and something along that line. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Okay. Um, so let me let me proceed and then um, it is going to be also useful to revisit this calculation by using the, the bulk boundary correspondence. That's another important uh, characteristic of topological uh, phases. So uh, we have been talking about uh, bulk state, bulk ground state, um, but as it turns out, um, we can also discuss uh, these uh, bulk uh, physics by using uh, physics at the boundary or physics at the edges. So um, we, we make roughly the following correspondence. So we have a bulk ground state wave function, this is psi i, and then there's a corresponding now partition function uh, uh, on the boundary. So I have a, I have a bulk, uh, bulk wave function, which is defined for, for bulk without any boundary, but now we can consider a system with boundary. And then the, there's a boundary excitations around the edge. And then um, we can define a partition function on, on, the, on the edge, okay? Um, so then maybe maybe I should start with actually this. So, so there's a correspondence between um, bulk wave function on spatial torus and the boundary partition function, which is defined for space time torus, uh, you know, one, one uh, space direction and the uh, uh, periodic time direction, temporal direction. Um, then as it turns out, so as I, as I mentioned like a few slides ago, uh, S and T matrices act on the bulk wave function on the spatial torus. And similarly, we can define S and T matrices acting on the boundary partition function. This, I, I'm going to use this symbol chi. And then um, these are basically the same. They, they carry the same information. Uh, this index A represents the um, partition function with specific sector or specific boundary condition. So, so um, roughly speaking, I have a um, edge excitations, um, but you can also consider um, edge excitation in the presence of quasi-particle in the bulk. And then uh, the quasi particle can be viewed as the end of a um, Wilson line or some sort of line object. And then um, this is a, um, so another way to say this is that this anion has to be accompanied with a, uh, some string attached. And then this string can end on the boundary. So the bulk excitation feeds the, the presence of the bulk quasi particle through this uh, string. So yes. So if you had a higher genus uh, Riemann surface as your spatial manifold, so now there's more large diffeomorphisms you can make. So would you need more than S and T? Do you need more matrices? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's right. So that has been discussed, for example, um, this paper, this paper. So we, we have a data beyond modular data. So they are related to being genus G. Riemann surface or Riemann surface or torus with some punctures. So there, there are more data. Here we I'm focusing on the uh, uh, torus, so that's why it's SMT. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so yeah, actually I don't know how to do that uh, in terms of boundary, but anyway, uh, there's a more than SMT if we go to higher genus uh, surfaces. So I think this can be this correspondence can be viewed as the um, 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 so if you think of a wave function which is driven on that particular time slice, um, that's a space-time boundary, like a, like a space-like boundary. If you have a physical boundary, it's a it's a it's a, once again boundary to the system, but it's now a, a running in the let's say vertical direction, so it's like a, a time-like boundary. But in, in topological system, these boundaries are, or relativistic systems, they are supposed to be equivalent. So, so that's, I think, how this boundary correspondence comes in. Although, of course, I don't have a precise uh, 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 
uh, proof for this if I don't have a relativi relativistic invariance. Anyway, I'm going to make use of this bulk boundary correspondence to compute topological entanglement entropy. So, so the um, topological entanglement entropy calculation from the point of view of boundary has been discussed, for example, in this paper. So, so the, the I'm consider, I would consider the following setup. I consider the topological states living on a spatial cylinder, let's say infinite cylinder for simplicity. And I'm going to make a partition. I make a, a entanglement boundary here to partition my system into region B and region, so region A and region B. Okay. Um, so I uh, so yeah, this is the entanglement boundary. It's not a physical boundary, but I consider edge state uh, uh, for, for the boundary here as if I have a physical boundary. And then um, we consider, uh, uh, so the entanglement entropy can be computed in the following way. We first consider within this edge theory, a um, something called a conformal boundary state, which satisfy this condition. Okay, that's step one. And then as it turns out, at least near this entangling boundary, ground state of the topological liquid, two plus one D uh, ground state, is very well approximated by this boundary state with this uh, uh, factor, regularization factor, uh, where edge is the um, Hamiltonian of the um, edge theory that's a gapless edge theory. Um, so, so, so this is the um, approximate ground state. So then, but we can we can take this as a um, ground state ansatz. So then we can now compute the um, reduced density matrix uh, from from this. Okay. Um, so um, then the, we will recover the um, entanglement entropy scaling with the topological entanglement entropy. Um, okay, so uh, I think this is an interesting calculation, and the, and the physical picture is that we physically first cut this uh, uh, topological liquid into two pieces, and then there's a physical um, uh, boundary excitations leaving here and leaving here. Once we completely cut the system, these two are completely independent of each other. They are not interacting. But however, you, you can sort of uh, consider the healing the wound, uh, healing the cut by connecting uh, these uh, uh, edge states or adding some particular uh, uh, potential to, to connect these edge states, to gap them out. That way we can actually go back to the original ground state. Okay, so, so sometimes this type of uh, procedure is called the cut and glue picture. Um, so that's how we how we get this uh, uh, boundary state. So I want to say a few more words about this. So um, this state, as I just briefly said, this can be viewed as the um, state of the edge state after introducing the tunneling or potential between these two modes in order to gap out these modes. For example, if you have a chiral boson theory living here, and living there. By the way, they have an opposite chirality, so that's why we can completely gap them. Then you can add some sort of cosine term. And then I think this is a statement basically that ground state near here is given by the boundary state with some minor modification. Okay, so, so this is a kind of interesting point of view because we are talking about now gapped state. Topological liquid is gapped everywhere, gapped everywhere, and in particular, it's also gapped near here. But we are describing this gapped state by using the, the conformal theory theory, which usually, you know, we usually use conformal theory theory to discuss gapless, gapless state to a quantum critical point. So boundary state, although it's a, um, it's, it's a, it is constructed uh, within the Hilbert space of gapless conformal theory theory, it is the uh, state which is fully gapped. So that is an uh, interesting in insight. One way to see this is that if you look at the spatial correlation function with respect to this boundary state, uh, uh, it basically has zero correlation. 
in the limit where we send this regularization parameter to zero. So this says a um, boundary state has no spatial correlation. This is just like a, a gap state in one plus one dimensions. To convince you further, if you consider a um, gap, uh, so gapped fermion, mass, massive free fermion theory here, psi represent left and spinner representing left and right, you can construct the ground state of this Hamiltonian explicitly, which is which is here, and then once you take the limit where uh, 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 this mass is very gap, very big, then this part reduces to the, just a sign of the mass term because k goes away, uh, and then that is nothing but the um, uh, state satisfying this this condition. That's the boundary condition for free thermia. But boundary conformal boundary state for free fermions. Okay. Um, anyway, we use this insight uh, to discuss the topological entanglement for two plus one D topological liquid. There are other applications of this idea, namely boundary state as a gap state. So, so for example, uh, in this paper, Cardi discussed the uh, ground uh, the phase diagram of one plus one D uh, Ising model using. Um, this ground state, sorry, this boundary state is ansatz for, for gapped uh, ground state. Uh, we can also discuss one plus one the uh, SPT phases, which are gapped and short ranged by using the method of boundary conformal figure theory. But that's another subject. Okay. So, so, sorry, uh, yes. may, may I ask you a question? Uh, yes. So in this formula, approximate formula for the ground state, e to the minus epsilon h, so h has this uh, uh, tunneling factor, so it's- uh, Oh, no, no, sorry, a, a, sorry, h conformal. does not- Yeah, h is actually just, uh, just the uh, con uh, uh, conformal uh, Hamilton. So you don't put in h edge this tunneling effect you were talking about. Right, so this is a gapless Hamilton. Okay. Yeah, but but in the Fermion example, it, uh, it uh, there is a mass. Yeah, so 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 I, uh, yeah, I'm going to take the, this particular limit because I want to have a, a limit where mass is very gap, a bit, very large. So then this part actually does not depend on the mass explicitly; only the sign comes in. Okay. Thank yeah. You. So the the information of the mass term somehow to, will be erased in this limit. So in this universal limit, uh, this identification is is more or less uh, more reliable. Okay. Other questions? Okay, maybe I should speed up a little bit <laughs> uh, since I think I have two hours. You know, I'm <laughs> a bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I should speed up a little bit. Um, so now I, I make use of this ansatz and this ansatz to compute the, the, the entanglement entropy, which is quite straightforward. So, 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 sorry, uh, again, uh, maybe we should make a short break. As oh a yeah, good point. idea, right. Uh, let, 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 something like five minutes when you feel like, okay? Yeah, sounds good to me, yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Now or or later, Shinsei. Yes. You want to do it now, the break, or later? You choose. Oh, okay. So why don't we take uh, maybe a few minutes break now? Right now. Yeah, right now, okay. because it's already one hour, and then maybe okay. people can ask questions during that time. But I will I will resume after I don't know. Um, okay. So we we take yeah. a break of a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so now I want to, to present the computation of topological entanglement entropy using this ANSAT. And that's straightforward. And um, um, also there's some important uh, conceptual point. And this is the kind of equation heavy uh, uh, slide, um, but it's rather simple. So uh, we first, once again, consider this boundary state, which is a solution to this equation. And this uh, uh, solution is known in the condensed uh, conformal field theory literature written this way. H is the um, particular, specifies a, a particular tower of states. 
n is the uh, level of uh, state. So h plus n is the eigenvalue of the stress energy tensor component L0. J just accounts for some degeneracy, but anyway, it's a very simple form. It's a sum of all this state uh, without any really coefficient. Um, and then um, I, I will keep this uh, h here, which which is which you can take just to be identity or trivial uh, case. But I also take into account the fact that you can thread a Wilson, Wilson line here to create the distinct ground state. So this H basically label a different ground state. Um, and then I just follow the recipe. So I first uh, uh, regularize this state by, by this um, edge state Hamiltonian. And then we normalize and then taking a partial trace gives me a, a reduced density matrix. Um, so then um, taking further trace, okay, so I first raise the uh, reduced density matrix to the power n and taking a further trace, I get this expression, which is given by the um, uh, ratio between two boundary partition function with different parameter. I have n here, that's the difference. Um, so now I want to take the limit where regularization parameter goes to zero, or, or, or I take this ratio to be infinity. And then um, to take this, uh, uh, in order to, to take this limit, I, I go to different bases by using this modular S transformation. Um, so so mod using modular S transformation, I can rewrite this tie in terms of a linear superposition of different partition functions, but with transformed parameter here. And this way we can take the limit easily. So um, this uh, calibration is the luminescence of the boundary entropy in conformal field theory or Affleck Ludwig G. So this calibration basically shows that entanglement entropy in topological liquid is related to the boundary entropy of boundary conformal field theory, which has been mentioned in these papers as well. Um, so, so now we are almost there. So taking knowing this result, uh, uh, we know um, um, the, the trace of the, the nth moment of radius density matrix, and then um, once again, modular S matrix appear here. And then that basically gives us um, entanglement entropy and the entanglement Rennie entropy. And once again, here I included a particular Wilson loop of type A threading here. Um, so previously I just did it for trivial ground state. So that's why I got index here. So, but this can be just represent trivial particle. In this case, it's exactly the same calculation we did using the bulk calculation. Anyway, so this is consistent with the, the entanglement entropy scaling we presented earlier. There's a, a non-universal part, which depends on the ratio between lengths of the uh, circumference of the cylinder and the regularization parameter. So this is a non-universal part but there's a universal part, which depends on the quantum dimension and the total quantum dimension. Okay. Um, so that's the entanglement entropy. So, so we learned that it captures this piece of the topological data. Um, so now I want to move on to different, if there are no question, I want to move on to different entanglement measures such as a um, entanglement negativity. So let me first briefly mention what uh, entanglement negativity is. So it is related to the question, this question, how to quantify quantum entanglement for mixed state. Okay. Um, the mixed state density matrix can, can, um, can, can appear, for example, if we consider a finite temperature state or if I consider a, a reduced density matrix, then it is naturally mixed. Um, so the, the problem is that entanglement entropy is a good entanglement measure, 
only for pure quantum state. Okay, uh, the technical term to, to describe this uh, uh, problem is that entanglement entropy is not the, um, it's, it, it does not monotonically decrease on the local operation and the classical communication LOCC. Okay, so entanglement entropy isn't, isn't good because it is, it actually captures uh, both quantum and the classical correlations. Um, but there's a um, different quantity, entanglement negativity, which is more suitable for, for that purpose. So um, entanglement negativity is, is defined by using this operation called partial transpose, which appears here. So negativity is given by, by first considering the partial transpose of this density matrix and take the norm of this uh, 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 partially transpose density matrix. It, it simply computes the um, uh, weighted sum of uh, uh, eigenvalues of partially transpose density matrix, which are negative. So this is the... Um, expression in terms of the spectrum of partially transposed density matrix. So we are going to use the um, log of, of this quantity, which is called logarithmic negativity, and that is somewhat more convenient. But you know, clearly, n and epsilon carry the same information. So we are going to consider log of the norm of partially uh, transposed density matrix. Shinsei, what does the subindex one mean? Yeah, so that's a, a, a kind of norm comes with index. So, um, 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 so here it simply means they are, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I forgot, it's like a, a L1 norm. So it's a, that's why it's put, put one. But it's simply square root of, of M, M dagger. And they take a trace that the, that's this that's the definition of this norm. Okay. And the, you can you know creative about the, the the power you can put in the definition of the norm that def, that, that that you can change uh, this number here. Um. So so by the way, what is a partial transpose which I didn't explain yet? So um, partial transpose is defined by by this equation. So if you have a um, tensor product Hilbert space HA tensor HB, then we take a particular basis, one for or HA and the other for HB. So then we can write down the matrix element of a um, some operator M. And then we take a transpose, we only try to take a transpose for, for the, this part, let's say B. So I exchange here and here without touching the matrix element associated to uh, Part of the, the part of the matrix element or index, which is related to Hilbert space A. Um, it is going to be rather useful to think this definition using diagrams. So that's what I present here. So um, I take operator M, and M is operator, so it takes input and output. And here blue is input and the red is output. Um, if I have a tensor product Hilbert space, I have a two inputs, one from region A, let's say, let's say one from a, a Hilbert space HA and the other from Hilbert space B. And they're taking a trace or partial trace means connecting uh, these two uh, lines, input and output, but, but in this case only for Hilbert space B. Taking a transpose means uh, we exchange input and output. So that's, that's why I'm exchange colors here. And taking partial transpose means I do this exchange only for or, or, or the part of the Hilbert space. So that's why I twist uh, these lines here. So mostly I will be interested in this reduced density matrix, which is partially transposed with respect to one of these Hilbert spaces, let's say Hilbert space B. So that is the um, partial transpose we are seeing here. And that is the um, that's the um, th that's how we define entanglement negativity. And entanglement ent entanglement negativity is a good entanglement measure for mixed states in the sense that uh, it is uh, monotonically decrease decreasing under local operation and the classical communication LOCC. Okay, so that's a 
uh, one try summary for entanglement negativity. Um, so entanglement negativity has been computed for topological liquid. Um, so let me let me uh, let me showcase some of the uh, result here. Um, so I consider as a specific setup, I consider spatial torus. And then I have a topological ground state on this spatial torus. And then we, we also put some uh, uh, topological flux here. And then depending on the type of topological flux here, we, we realize different ground state as before. And in this, in this case, I consider a generic uh, superposition of, of topological state here. So I have some uh, 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 wave function specifying the linear superposition of this ground state, psi A. And then in this setup, I, I try partition my, my uh, torus into three regions, A1, A2, B. And in this particular case, A1 and A2 are completely adjacent to each other. So what I'm going to do is to first uh, take a partial trace over B. So then we are left with a state supported on this region A1 union A2, which is now mixed because I, 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 I integrated over degrees of freedom in B. Okay, once, once we get the mixed state, I take a partial transpose with respect to A2, like here. Then we, we compute entanglement negativity. Here I'm using a replica trick for entanglement negativity. Um, so um, the calculation is exactly the same. That the exercise we did for topological entanglement, it's, it's almost the same. Um, certainly more complicated, but it's almost the same. And then this is the result. Um, so um, as before, like in a topological entanglement entropy calibration, we have a, a part which is non-universal in the sense that it depends on the microscopic details, but there are the part of the a, a negativity which depends only on this topological data, like a quantum dimension, and this uh, amplitude psi. Okay, um, you can compare. It is in interesting to compare this result with mutual information defined for this setup. So mutual information is the um, entanglement entropy for A1 union A2 minus is, uh, entanglement for A1 and entanglement for A2. And that we get the um, similar result. Um, yeah, so um, this is a result, but this from this result, we see entanglement negativity, at least as compared to mutual information, it has an interesting property such that um, entanglement negativity, Oh, actually, do you see my screen? <laughs> okay. It is okay. Okay, it's good, okay. Good, good. Yeah, okay, good. Because it's good. It's something good. Pop, popped up to show, to, to allow me that uh, participants fine. can now see my slides. Okay, good. Okay, so now it's fine. So um, negativity has this kind of interesting property that this, this second part, the side dependent part, appears only when we have a non abelian topological order. Because in that case, uh, uh, for abelian topological order, uh, uh, dA is always one, so this part just completely gone. Whereas for mutual information, you get side dependence, uh, uh, both for abelian and the non abelian topological order. So also the information entering into I and E are the same, just slightly different combination, but maybe negativity from that point of view, it may be useful to distinguish Abelian and the non-Abelian topological order, okay? Um, another in interesting application for negativity is to take a look at the finite temperature negativity, so then, it's obviously you know, we are now talking about mixed quantum state, and then the um, what we want to study here is the um, topological order, possibly at finite temperature. So so far, maybe I haven't said clearly, but I have been focusing at the properties at zero temperature, but we can also um, discuss the topological order at finite temperature, and as it turns out, for two dimensional. Um, two plus one dimensional topological order phases, 
finite temperature always just destroy topological order. Um, but in higher dimensions, um, some topological order, or sorry, maybe in higher dimensions, topological order can survive even at finite temperature. For example, for four plus one D toric code model, it does support topological order even at finite temperature. And then um, um, these papers studied a, um, entanglement and negativity at finite temperature uh, toric code model. And then they, they once again identify the scaling of the entanglement negativity. Um, so um, as in topological entanglement entropy for ground state, we identify a, a area law uh, part and then the, this constant part. And then um, this, paper, this paper found out this topological part is sensitive to the finite temperature topological order. And this part can disappear if we go through finite temperature uh, topological transition to go to, to uh, a trivial phase. So this can be, negativity can be useful to study um, topological entanglement entropy or topological order at finite temperature. Okay, so these are, these are two, two setups uh, where negativity has been studied. One for uh, reduced density matrix, which is mixed, and the other for um, uh, total state, which is mixed at finite temperature. May I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I'm, an, I'm Andrea. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, result for negativity you say is sensible to non abelian uh, uh, particles, non abelian st statistics. Do you mm -hmm. have a simple physical feature for this feature? Yeah, um, I personally don't have a simple picture. This has been you know, discussed in this paper. And then I think there's a more recent paper discussing uh, this type of uh, property further. But um, yeah, I, unfortunately I don't have a very um, straightforward uh, physical interpretation for this. Why a billion or non billion should matter? I mean. Good question. Yeah, I don't have a simple physical okay. picture. Okay. Yeah, but uh, that's a very good question, yeah. Other questions? Okay, so um, let me move on to slightly different topic. Um, and then um, I want to now define a um, um, negativity and in particular partial transpose for uh, systems consisting of many anions. And then, so that is the, um, um, different setup than, than before, uh, because we don't now talk about ground state, but, but rather than I'm interested in uh, the excitations above the ground state and they, and they discuss the um, properties of many body state above the ground state. Um, so to discuss such a um, entanglement for, for anions, we have to go back to the graphical uh, representation, which I introduced uh, earlier in this talk. But let me, let me actually warm up with the um, simple uh, spin models, like a two spins. And then I, I just, uh, you know, it may be overkilling, but I will, I will use the graphical notation introduced by Penrose. And that allows me to generalize the, the calculation of the entanglement and the negativity for spins to, to more complicated Kenyan existence. So we consider the entanglement of a bell pair or EPR pair, which is the spin singlet state. Um, so Penrose gave us a, a graphical way to make a calculation for SU2 spins, and I follow his, his uh, uh, rule. So um, this spin singlet, which is the anti-symmetric plus minus uh, uh, amplitude, this can be represented by this say, cap uh, diagram using this uh, graphical calculation, that's this epsilon tensor, that's the wave function. Um, so now to compute entanglement entropy, for example, we want to take the uh, density matrix, so that's EPR bra and EPR, uh, sorry, EPR ket and EPR bra. So I just uh, write these two diagrams uh, upside down to form a density matrix. 
And then um, to compute entanglement entropy, we have to compute partial trace first, uh, or maybe I have to take a moment, but here just for simplicity, I take a fast moment. So that corresponds to connecting the um, this input and output bond, but I do this only for second spin or B spin. So from here, I get this, this diagram. So this diagram, you can just straight, straight, uh, straight uh, up. So this means uh, once I trace out the second spin, I get the um, identity uh, uh, density matrix, which is an infinite temperature state. So that's the state with perfect ignorance uh, for the state uh, of spin A. So that's, that's the um, signature of maximal entanglement between A and B spin. Okay, so um, uh, as it turns out, you can discuss the um, entanglement for uh, uh, systems of anions using uh, similar diagrams because in, in the anionic systems, Hilbert space and the um, rule, fusion rules and, and so gradings and so on, they are given uh, in terms of diagrams. So it is quite uh, natural to use these graphical notations to discuss entanglement. Entropy. So this for entanglement entropy, this has been uh, discussed in this paper, in particular, uh, most recent paper by, by, by Bonderson and companies. Here I'm trying to discuss now entanglement negativity for anionic systems. Um, so, uh, but before doing this, I take uh, uh, I compute entanglement negativity for spin systems, not for anion system. So now I have to take a partial transpose. And as I, as I um, showed you earlier, that should correspond to, the, to exchanging input and output trine only for spin B, let's say. So exchanging this input and this output, sorry, maybe I'll, the other way around, I get the new diagram where I get the crossing now. And once again, this, these lines, can, you can straight them up to get this uh, uh, new diagram. And this diagram is actually this diagram. So that's what, that's what you get after partial transpose. And then to compute a entanglement negativity, we have to compute the norm of this uh, uh, partially transpose density matrix. By equation, it's, it's this quantity. But this we can also compute by using uh, diagrams. So I can just stack these two diagrams to compute this combination, and then um, take a square root and a trace, we get the log two, which is the entanglement negativity for spin two spin one halves. Okay. So what I want to do is now to uh, generalize this to, to any ions, and then um, simply what we will do is to somehow upgrade these uh, diagrams for spins to, to diagrams for any ions. So um, um, I have a um, EPR pair or Bell pair for anions, which is represented by this diagram. And this diagram, you can interpret it as a pair creation of A and uh, its conjugate out of vacuum. That's how we create the entangled pair of anions. And as before, we can compute density matrix by taking a, a ket and bra. Um, but now we can once again twist uh, these two uh, legs, input and output, for the second anions to get partially transposed uh, density matrix. So we use a braiding operation. So 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 that's why we have this uh, one of the lines is, is stuck on top of the other. So this is our proposed definition for for partial transpose for anionic systems. Um, if, you are, if you are uncomfortable with these uh, diagrams, there's a particular uh, specific meaning in terms of equations. Um, you just need to be a little bit more careful, but, but basically this gives us the um, definition of partial transpose for anions. Okay, so let me, let me discuss a few uh, examples of this. Uh, uh, our definition of partial transpose. So I want to give you a. I have a, a comment or a question. Yeah. Um, in your all of these operations, assume that 
for spins is very clear, but if you take some microscopic mold that you think is going to be in some topological phase, the natural inner product that you're going to do to use is local in the theory, whereas this uh, the inner product you're using here is the so-called topological inner product, which is not local. Yeah, 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 uh, exactly, yeah. And so there is a question how you actually implement this in an actual micro microscopic model calculation. Right, right. So let me first demonstrate this for microscopic model of Kita F chain. So this is the case for fermions. It's not a generic anion model, but nevertheless, uh, that's actually where I, I, I started to, to uh, uh, wonder what the definition of partial transpose for particle with generic statistics. And then um, um, that gives us some, some confidence that this is going to work for, for, for sensible models. And then um, we can sort of interpolate uh, our confidence to more generic anionic system. But, but absolutely, so because anionic systems, they are non-local object, they are non-locally correlated. And, and that's why definition of the, the partial transport is more difficult because in the bosonic definition, we completely assume that these two Hilbert spaces are you know, independent of each other, totally decoupled which isn't the case for anionic systems, even for fermionic systems, HA, uh, operator in HA and operator in HB, they do not commute in general. So we have to somehow take into account that non-locality into the definition. And the proposal is to just use this diagram, which takes into account the, um, uh, these uh, things automatically. That's a proposal. Good. Um, so yeah, let me let me show you how it works for this, this by taking this KTF chain as a specific example. So it's a simple simple model of one-dimensional fermion hopping on a lattice, one-dimensional chain, the hopping and the uh, superconducting for the parameter, which is they are just the parameters, and then um, um, there's this uh, another parameter, chemical potential. I'm going to take T is equal to delta for simplicity. And then phase diagram is this very simple phase diagram where I have a topological superconductor when a chemical potential is, is smaller than T and delta or two times T and delta. So this is the, the, the system where we support Majorana uh, states at the boundary. So, um, I take this example to demonstrate how we use these uh, diagrams to compute entanglement negativity. So this is the, the, the calculation we are using diagrams and we are going to compare this result with numerics later. So uh, this is a setup. So I have a one dimensional Kita F chain and then we try partition the Kita F chain into three regions, B, A1, A2, B, and then we take a partial trace over B to get the mixed state supported on A1 union A2. And then we are going to take a partial transpose for A2, let's say. To compute this uh, entangle entanglement, associ entanglement negativity associated to this setup, we use the um, kind of cut and glue approach. We, we did for two plus one D case, but we kind of do the one plus one D version. <clears throat> so near the entangling cut, I have a um, edge mode, which is just a, just a Majorana fermion. So I, I, I denote the um, entanglement, uh, sorry, the Majorana fermions associated to this entangling cut gamma not gamma one, and similarly gamma two, gamma three for this entangling cut, a butcher cut, and gamma four, gamma five for, for this cut. Um, so, so the total density matrix can be obtained by taking a ket and bra. So as before, we have this density matrix, but now we have just a more uh, particle, just, just um, instead of one pair, I have now three pairs of um, fermions or anions. We take a partial trace over B, so I connect uh, 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 bonds associated to these regions. So I connect here and here. Here and here and here and here, so we get this diagram, and then 
uh, straightening up these diagrams, we get this uh, density matrix, which is the um, density matrix for region A1 union A2. And then I take a partial transpose with respect to A1. So that's why I twist this uh, line. So this calculation in the end gives us the uh, negativity of log square root of two, where square root of two is the um, quantum dimension of a Majorana fermion. Um, so this can be compared with a numerics. So this is the um, eight side of Majorana chain and we compute it negativity for, for various ways. So um, first uh, we, you see a, a 0 0.5 here. So this is the entanglement negativity uh, normalized by log two. So deep inside the topological phase, we do recover uh, this uh, calculation, which we just did. So that's the um, confirmation of, of, of the uh, reasonableness of our definition of partial transpose and the uh, entanglement negativity for anions, or in this case, fermions. So it's uh, interesting to compare this with a um, different uh, definition of entanglement negativity. So um, here we could do, at least in this model, we could do the following. So we take a fermionic chain, but we use jordan wegner transformation to convert it to the Ising model, spin system. And the Ising system or spins, it's a, just a bosonic uh, 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 degrees of freedom. So we can take a bosonic partial transpose to compute partial transpose. Um, if we do this, we get this uh, uh, red curve with um, um, blue, blue circles. So this is the um, result from jordan Wigner transformation. So th this does not agree with, with this definition. Um, but but this is a bit strange because it is zero in topologically, it's very close to zero in topological phase, whereas it's this bar is bigger in trivial phase. So that's clearly different from what we expect uh, because in the in the in the in the topological superconductor phase, we expect more quantum correlation than trivial superconductor phase. So this is counterintuitive. On the other hand, if we use the um, uh, definition of the partial transpose, which we uh, make use of um, uh, a fermionic uh, sign, uh, properly taking into account the fermionic sign, we get this green result. And that, that result agrees with the topological calculation we did here in, in, this, in this limit, in the extreme topological limit. Uh, but it has a, um, overall, it has a more reasonable uh, behavior because we have a, a quantum correlation in topological phase and we have a less quantum correlation in trivial phase. Another check is that at the critical point, here it's eight side chain, so we don't see any structure here, but as we make systems as bigger and bigger, uh, we eventually get a, 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 a conformal field theory result at the critical point. So using the, um, our definition of entanglement negativity, we can recover the known conformal field theory prediction. So that's another that check. Okay. Is there, is there a question for, for uh, fermionic uh, entanglement negativity? Sorry, what is the prediction from the CFT? Yeah, so it depends on the configuration, but uh, I think if these two intervals are adjacent, you get yes. C over four and then log of uh, lengths of these intervals. Okay. That agrees with, uh, that's something we can compute from our formula and agrees with this prediction. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So the IC mode in some sense, which is bosonic, as you said, is abelian. So the fact that this is going to zero means that it's, it's like your diagnostic that the state is abelian, right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure we can say it that way, but yeah. I mean, if I take your argument that you used before, you would have said that the IC model is abelian. That, that... Yeah, if I take a bosonic, yeah. So, but I, I guess we shouldn't take this bosonic uh, these are too seriously because we are studying a fermion chain anyway. So that's my, 
It's well, mine. But you could have studied the Ising model as well. We could have studied the Ising model, yes. In this case, we should we should get this. So we could say, oh, you know, that's that may be reasonable because we have seen negativity has a trivial behavior for yeah, but this is yeah important because there is a subtlety when you do Jordan Wigner that the mapping is not one to one. Yes, exactly. That's uh, right. And I think this is reflected in this result. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right, right, right. So we, we think the boson in, in, in the, the this uh, string caused by Jordan Wigner had plays a very crucial role. Are there other questions? Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, so maybe this is a side, so I go skip. So then uh, we can also consider, um, this, this is another example of calculation we did. We take a two spin one half anions in this particular topological order and we compute entanglement negativity but in this case, we consider a uh, superposition of two density matrices. So this, this represents one um, density matrix, which is as before, we have a um, pair of spin one half anions created from the vacuum and they have a, a, a bra and the cat here. But, but in addition to that, we consider different diagram, which represent the different density matrix. And then we control the, 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 the mixture of this uh, um, two density matrices, which is motivated by this type of state we consider for spin one half called the Warner state. So that's a mixture of entangled uh, density matrix and the mixture of the trivial uh, and the trivial density matrix. Um, so if we use our definition of partial transpose and compute uh, entanglement negativity for different uh, uh, anion theory with different K, we get these different curves. Um, so interesting feature is that as we make this K very large, like a hundred, then it's, this result starts agrees with the, uh, uh, what we see in the regular spin one half degrees of freedom. Okay, so that's like a kind of sanity check. Our result does reproduce the regular spin one half result in this uh, quote unquote semi classical limit. Um, another interesting observation is that for spin one half, like a regular spin, uh, entanglement negativity has an extended region where it, it vanishes, like this region. And then at, at, at some point, it starts to be finite. So this behavior is known as sudden death. So if you approach this point from, from the above, entanglement negativity decreases and suddenly goes to zero, and then it goes all the way from here to here. Um, so this um, sudden death phenomena does not seem to occur in an ionic system. The, the, this um, vanishing of the negativity always happens at one point in this, in this particular example where the, 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 the anion diagram is simply two disconnected lines. Um, so this seems to be the generic trend. So um, also for regular spin one half, there's the region where entanglement negativity vanishes, but for anionic systems, negativity, the, the, the locus of the vanishing negativity from the um, kind of sort of zero measure set in the, in the parameter space. So it, it's, it's some give us some insight on the nature of the entanglement for the for the anionic system. Um, another important uh, property I want to mention for anionic negativity is that it is LOCC monotone. So I think I started off by saying entanglement negativity. So entanglement entropy is not a good quantum entanglement to measure at finite temperature because it is not monotone. It doesn't monotonically decrease under area CC. But, but the anionic negativity we define is a area CC monotone. So it's a kind of sensible uh, entanglement measure. Yeah, so I hope to revisit this uh, in the future to, this, to, to get further insight on the entanglement in anionic systems. 
Is there any question for the anionic negativity and the anionic partial transpose? Good. So, um, so that's all I want to say for partial transpose. So we discuss partial trace to discuss entanglement entropy. We discuss the partial transpose for for um, entanglement negativity, and they. This somehow give us hints that partial operations, operations defined for a particular part of the total system, it seems to be a very, very important uh, operations. So um, I want to give you a one more example where it says a, now I'm going to talk about partial rotation. That also, I think that is also useful to, to extract the um, data, underlying data of topological topologically ordered phases. So um, partial rotation is a following operation. So I consider some, some a subregion D, okay? And then um, we, we have a, um, we consider n-fold rotation around this, uh, around the, at the center of D. So D is, D, the shape of D is supposed to be a, a consistent with the n-fold rotation symmetry. Um, so then uh, we take a ground state expectation value of this uh, partial n-fold rotation on the disk. Okay, so that, that is the, um, um, this quantity. Um, so this quantity, uh, by using this kind of surgery type uh, approach, we can see that it is related to the partition function of the topological uh, phase on lens space. Um, so um, I think recently this, this quantity is called higher center charge and it is related to the, it may capture the, uh, it, it can capture the gapability condition of the edge states in, in these uh, systems. Um, anyway, this is another space time manifold. And then as we consider different space time manifold, we may be able to capture different parts of a topological data. It is also instructive to consider this quantity by using the edge state approach. Um, so we can compute this uh, quantity using the boundary conformal field series. Um, so, so here, this is the um, microscopic expression we have to compute. Um, so in addition to the Hamiltonian now, we have this uh, momentum or, or momentum along this entangling surface, so that induces um, partial uh, rotation around this uh, disk. It is divided by, L is a circumference of this uh, disk, and it is divided by N because I consider N-fold rotation. So this quantity, once again, using the edge state approach, we can relate it to the boundary partition function and in particular boundary S and T matrices. So this is the expression we get. Um, so this can be, for example, computed for um, particular topological system. Uh, in this paper, we computed this for chiral P wave superconductor. Uh, and then we get the following result from the, uh, uh, from the uh, edge theory calibration. Uh, so we compare this result with um, numerics on the uh, uh, lattice chiral P wave superconductor put on the hexagonal lattice. So um, the phase of this quantity is, is reasonably quantized to these expected values. Um, so anyway, like the um, um, entanglement entropy and entanglement negativity, this captures a different piece of information, which is given by the, this combination of S and T matrices. Um, um, interesting point, maybe another interesting point to mention is that the, the, this, this uh, entanglement, sorry, this uh, partial rotation comes with this phase part of the information as well as the amplitude part when n is odd. So um, this may be related to once again, the quantum dimension of the anionic particle. 
And this may not be captured by fully topological calibration, but, but nevertheless, it is, it is there. Um, so um, I presented this calibration for chiral p wave superconductor, but this um, lens space or um, partial n fold rotation may be also useful for uh, to study SPT phases, in particular, SPT phases protected by crystalline rotation symmetry. So that's actually how we computed this quantity. How, that's, that's the reason why we were interested in this quantity in the first place. Uh, it can also detect um, um, SPT phases, two plus one the SPT phases classified by, by this uh, third group cohomology. That the topological invariant for such SPT can also be created by using this n fold rotation symmetry. Good. So um, let me briefly, uh, yeah, that's all I want to say for partial rotation. Um, um, and then um, if there is no question, um, this is the um, kind of very short summary on the Outlook slide. So we have seen at least three kinds of partial operations. And these operations are useful to, you know, it's kind of a way to put topological phases uh, on the um, interesting space-time manifold just by using ground state. And then this allows us to detect or extract a um, part of the topological data, maybe not all topological data, but, but we can still learn something. So it's a um, kind of microscopic way of doing surgery, which is possible for for or gapped uh, topologically or phases. Um, both bulk and the H theory approach, uh, they are useful to, to, to make explicit calculations for these quantities. And then, then there's an obvious question, you know, how much we can push this direction? Um, because we, we have there's a, um, a lot of data to characterizing topological liquid. And so far, we just uh, we are just able to capture part of the part of the um, data. So, can we measure or can we detect all such data? Or maybe not all, but at least substantial portion of topological data. How can we capture them? So, um, there may be other entanglement measures which may be useful for our purposes. But unfortunately, I didn't have a time to discuss. Just mention a few keywords. There may be. Um, a symmetry resolution of quantum entanglement, where we can uh, discuss quantum entanglement for each uh, quantum number sector or in the presence of background gauge fields. So they are known as charged entanglement or symmetry resolved entanglement. Uh, we could have a um, spatial region A and B, which are geometrically linked. So that's called linking entanglement. And there are other entanglement measures for mixed states, such as the diffracted entropy or held entropy, and so on and so forth. There are some works or many works uh, on these quantum entanglement measures. And the, I think one of the interesting questions is, can we measure some of these um, entanglement-related quantities by experiment? And then um, if we ask this question maybe, I don't know, like uh, 10 years or maybe seven years ago, it wasn't very realistic, but, but by now, there are uh, experiments measuring um, entanglement in many body quantum systems, whereas in, let's say, cold atomic systems. So it's becoming realistic to measure these quantities. At least, we, I hope it can be, these techniques can be used to, to, to measure quantum entanglement or negativity in topologically ordered liquid. So that's a future direction. So with that, I think I presented everything I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention. So these are claps. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have, I have a, may I ask two questions? I am Andrea Capelli. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so um, I got a bit lost when you speak about the uh, entanglement of anionic systems. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, is this an entanglement of an excited state and not of the ground state? Is right. that the point? That's right. So it's slightly aside in some sense from the main part of the talk. But but it's the um, you can start from a topological ground state, but you can start to excite anions. Okay. And then um, but these anions they 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 also interact and they form their own many body state. So the, the entanglement measure I discussed for anion they may be useful to discuss such state. So ent entanglement of the state that includes some anions above the ground state. Right, right. Uh -huh. But that's OK. That, so then I have a second question. Second question is, uh, you know that uh, another point of view about uh, 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 testing uh, topological states is by transport properties. So compute some universal transport properties. And so why why you think that it's better to use entanglement to extract this topological data? Can you yeah, so that, uh, that can you comment on this? Yeah, that is certainly a fundamental question. Um, I, I mean, I yeah. So that we go back all the way to this motivation, right? So yeah, it's certainly you know maybe my, it, yeah. So discussing like a transport measurement or other. We're well, measuring topological order. Maybe it's much more direct, I would say. So I don't, you know, I, I have, you know, I'm not against that. Um, here, I think it's it's a, um, um, let's say they can be more convenient for numerics, for example, um, because ground state we may get, but to, to, to study, um, transport or other things. Um, we, we have more things to do in numerics. Um, um, and the, yeah, I think who knows, you know, these are um, topological invariants or something we can easily measure. Um, um, I don't know, they, they may be complementary because um, they may be able to capture different pieces of uh, underlying data. But I yeah, so I think we should do both. I wouldn't say easily measured. It took twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> that that's true. <laughs> yeah, so maybe if I say easily, they will be offended. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you know, something. I, it's true that you know um, something related to anions moving around the edge or something like that. It's more kind of experimental setup. And so. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I just took a particular point of view that we, to, to, to challenge us, you know, how, what kind of entanglement, sorry, what kind of data we can extract just from the ground state, but, but, uh, but uh, I, I guess in practice, we, should, we shouldn't, you know, focus just on that. We should try various other things, yeah. The issue here is that, for instance, in this sort of interferometric, measurements from which you can extract some you know, uh, topological data. Okay? But these are all local by their own nature, essentially the way the, the experiment is done. They're done essentially by local constrictions. And to measure the negativity, I think it's inherently non-local to do the partial trace. I wouldn't right. know how to begin to formulate that in terms of uh, a set of gates <laughs> that um, have you, I mean, this is part of the question even in, in the experiments in cold atoms is how they actually do it. That's right. So, 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 yeah, I think I'm encouraged by the fact that, so I'm particularly interested in this experiment from uh, Innsbruck. So they, they propose to use a randomized measurement to, to measure entanglement entropy first. But this protocol is can be extended to measure entanglement negativity and the, some other quantities involved involving partial transpose. So yeah, I'm kind of hoping you know it, it's it's a bit of course you know I mean people people used to think that partial transpose is not proper quantum operation in the sense that it produces negative entanglement, sorry, density matrix entry eigenvalues with negative eigenvalues, but with, with statistics, randomized measurement, you can still measure 
uh, entanglement negativity, and then that that may be an um, um, interesting thing to do. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess since they they all involve just the ground state, it may be more stable. I'm not not entirely sure, but that may be another. One one interesting result you show at the end is that uh, function on the land space is related to to an entropy. That that I find very interesting because when discussing properties of anomalies, global anomalies, you have a partition function of very peculiar uh, uh, space time, and you don't you don't know what to make out of of it. I mean, just. A, Kind of technical, but if you can relate it to some more physical idea like uh, entropy, that's uh, I think very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, hopefully, yeah, e exactly. So um, I think there's the um, interesting um, challenge to relate these different manifolds to different physical operations we do, and the, once again, hopefully, this can be experimentally feasible. Uh, sometime in future. Since I had a very quick question. Uh, so at the very beginning with the replica technique, so uh, you had your partition function on the three ball bounded by S2. How did you go from, how did you get the S3 that you get at the end, the three sphere? Right, so first we compute the normalization. So we starting from here, you get the state on S2. And then we, you first compute the norm of the state. And then that that's corresponds to the partition function on S3. So that computes the norm of the state. So that's sitting here. Now the the denominator. So that th for the numerator, we have to start from many of these uh, three balls, and then we partition, and then you know we grew them. Once you grew them, what you get in the end is just a one one big S three. As far as I remember. Yes, okay, so you basically right. get a you get like a yeah. one point compactification of you compactify the. R3 into S3, basically, when you take um, the energy on it. Here, I just actually start with S2, so. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I identify, so take a two S2, two, 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 uh, two uh, three balls, and then you kind of half grew them. Yeah. But then, oh, okay, so in this case, in the end, you, you grew them all, so it's obvious that you get, uh, 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 three ball, right? Because you grew here yeah. and here and here. So that means you just get this uh, one big S3. And same thing happens after the success of growing. You just get the big, big uh, S3. And they, each, each, each of these ball just consists of, uh, uh, it's like a, like a, yeah, like a, uh, like a uh, cutting your pizza. You have a one over N <laughs> slice. Okay. Well, okay. another way to say that is that you identify the partition function of the, theory has been on S3 in the sense that the vacuum is identified with S3 in some, in some sense. So that's why you do the evolution from the S2 boundary into the interior, right? Oh, right, right. That, that, that may be more straightforward to say. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. <laughs> because it's topological as the size of S3 does not matter. So if you just successively do that, it's just a time. Ever. You can think of N as a time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you just, what you do is just create a, you know, space-time manifold where ground state evolved from to itself, that's the S3. Hello. Okay. okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Jacopo Viti. So my question is about the uh, linear combination of uh, uh, Ishibashi state that produces this uh, ground state. So normally uh, you, you the gap the ground state. So 
I don't think you know the coefficient of this uh, expansion for physical system. So I'm wondering uh, how this uh, psi A that you see, no? New formula, I mean, they can affect uh, your prediction because typically I don't think you know this coefficient or there are other physical assumptions for, uh, for them. Yeah, so that's right. That's right. We don't we don't know the superposition precisely. So, um, so here I just excite the some 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 uh, unknown coefficient and just uh, studying how these coefficients affect the the mutual information and negativity. Um, but you're asking, is there a way to determine psi? Um, that's a good question. Um, Your result depends so clearly on psi a, no? So right, right. It depends on psi a. I mean, you could have prepared the state in some arbitrary linear combination of the generated states on the torus, right? <laughs> yeah, but in principle, yeah, we get some some uh, uh, linear superposition. But one, one thing I know is that uh, you, you. So one thing I know is that you know. Although in principle we can create the um, arbitrary superposition of this uh, this this type, sometimes they, they, we want to get the um, single state, a single Ishibashi state, or single topological ground state, because that may be convenient. Or in particular, that may be convenient basis. So then there's the um, idea of using uh, entanglement entropy such that we we we, we consider the minimal entangled state. Right. And then that, uh, if you if you require that, it is going to extract. Uh, I remember HS. that, 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 that in the the paper by Cardi, there was an answer to calculate this psi a, I guess. Uh, ah, okay, okay. But I don't know if actually did this was really working. In, I mean, uh, in practice or not? Yeah, that that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that I don't know. Yes, there may be a good protocol to set psi a to be Kronecker delta a a prime, but uh, like if it is generic, maybe support. it's uh, maybe maybe some way to do it, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there more questions? Okay, so we thank again uh, Shinsei for this uh, very nice uh, review talk. And uh, okay, so goodbye to everyone and see you next time. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.